Um, so maybe we should we should get started. I want oh, yeah. to welcome everybody to another edition of Reader Meet Writer. This is an online writer series sponsored by the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance and the New Atlantic Independent Booksellers Association. I am the host of Reader Meet Writer. My name is Wiley Cash. I am a novelist and I have a new novel coming out in September called When Ghosts Come Home. I hope you'll give it a shot. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about the organizations uh, that sponsor this event, the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance and the New Atlantic Independent Bookseller Association. These are organizations that represent hundreds of independent bookstores in the Southeast and up the Atlantic seaboard. Um, and these independent bookstores are the lifeblood of our literary community. Normally, a writer like Chris would be burning up the highways and the hotels and the airports on a book tour, but we can't do that because of COVID. The world is opening up, but not quite yet. So we're bringing writers like Chris Ava to you the best way we can. And that is through this series, Reader Meet Writer. We've been doing it since last summer. We have done... 60, 70, 80 events. I don't even know how many we've done, but you all have been so supportive. And I want to encourage you to beg you to keep it going all the way through the end of this season and into the fall. As I mentioned tonight, we're hosting Chris Offit. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with his work, both on the page and on the screen. And if any point tonight you have a question about something that Chris and I are talking about, go down to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your question in, and I will ask Chris your question at the end of the show. Make sure to include your name and the name of your favorite or your home independent bookseller. I want to encourage you to join us next week on Thursday, June 24th at 7 p.m., when we'll be hosting novelist Terry Roberts to discuss his new novel, My Mistress's Eyes Are Raven Black. So please join us for that. But tonight, I'm really excited that we are hosting Chris Offit for his new novel, The Killing Hills, which came out just two days ago on Tuesdays. So this is early on in his tour, and I want to thank him for joining us, and I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. A little about him. Chris grew up in Haldeman, Kentucky, population 200, a former mining town in the Appalachian Hills. His books include Country Dark, Kentucky Straight, Out of the Woods, The Good Brother, The Same River Twice, No Heroes, and My Father, The Pornographer. He wrote and produced scripts for True Blood, Weeds, and Trimé. His television work was nominated for an Emmy. He currently lives in rural Lafayette County near Oxford, Mississippi, and his new novel, The Killing Hills, was released this week. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, Wiley. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody who's uh, watching and to echo what Wiley said about the su supporting the independent bookstores. They're, they keep literature alive and we need them. Uh, we need them more than ever. I think literature in a way is under attack, literacy in general. So thank you to SIBA uh, and what was it, the Atlantic the New Atlantic Independent Bookseller Association. Is that a new outfit? It is. Okay. It is, yeah. Good. It's a Good new luck. conglomeration of stores, yeah. And you're, you mean, you're living outside Oxford. I mean, that's a real book community. And oh, yeah. Square Books is, you know, Oxford used to be the home of William Faulkner, and now Oxford's the home of Square Books. I would argue that Square Absolutely. Books keeps that place going as much as, as the ghost of William Faulkner does. And I know you had your first event at the store. Yeah. Um, a couple of nights ago. So I mean, Square Books is the heart of this town. Yeah, absolutely. And I always love going on tour at Square Books because I know I'm going to have fun after my event. Oh, I'm yeah. going to have a headache the next morning, but I know I'm going to have fun after my event. So uh, here at the top of our show, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the Killing Hills? Well, it's um, I'd always I, I, I ever since I was a child, I'd wanted to write a crime novel. I, I, be, I loved them with Nancy Drew and then the Hardy Boys and the Dana Girls uh, uncovering mysteries and Sherlock Holmes. Um, and I kind of thought for a long time that I was writing what I thought were crime, was crime fiction, but wasn't, wasn't regarded that way. Even the last book, I thought like there's a bootlegger, there's stolen money, there's homicides, there's prison. So uh, this one is just a little bit more overt. Um, and it's set in Eldridge County, which I invented. 
Um, although it's the same county that most of my stuff is invented stuff is set in. Um, I don't know how it was like where, where you were, Wiley, but when I was a kid, if somebody got, there weren't that many killings, but if somebody got shot, half the county knew who did it and why, right? The other half had a pretty good idea and nobody was going to talk to the police about it. They're just the mistrust of, of law enforcement and politicians. And, and that still kind of holds true. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to see what would happen if I wrote a novel where uh, someone was, was, a body was found and no one knew why, you know, this is a very nice person, no enemies, no disputes, nothing. And then to make it more difficult, it's a, a the county has its first uh, female sheriff who had ascended to the office because the sheriff uh, passed away. And there, so she's kind of got her first homicide and there's a lot of people in the county who would like to see her fail. You know, they don't want her to solve. They're, they just don't care for a woman having that degree of authority. Uh, that's it. And then it, she gets her brother to help her who happens to be in town because his wife's pregnant. He's a homicide investigator in the army. Uh, he's back on leave. And that's without giving anything away. That's the bare bones of the, the premise. And, and I, I don't want to give anything away, away either. And I want to talk a little bit about a little more later on about the genre of this being a crime novel. I, I've had some of, some of the similar experiences you've had where you don't quite know where the genre starts or where it ends or exactly what you're writing, maybe until you finish it. And when I read this book, I thought, oh, this is going to be like a slick, fast reading crime novel. And in some ways it is. I read it quickly, but I didn't read it quickly necessarily because it was plot driven crime you know, uh, cloak and dagger stuff. I read it quickly because I genuinely enjoyed being in the company of the characters and every single scene. Wow. Um, wow. They're Thanks. just, they're so interesting. The turns of phrase, the dialogue, the, the spatial awareness. I didn't plan on talking about any of this, but mm -hmm. the spatial awareness in the scene as a character, especially like, uh, like your main character, Mick Harden, the veteran, who's, whose sister is, is the sheriff, Mick is constantly clocking his surroundings of yeah. knowing what's here, what's the signpost, what can I come back to, where's the threat, where's the, you know, where's the safe space. So as a reader, this was just an easy book to read. And so as much as you are writing a crime novel, not easy to read, but it's easy to disappear into this book. Mm -hmm. So as much as you were writing a crime novel, were you thinking beyond the genre in terms of these really deep characterizations? I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that either beyond or within the genre at all. I, I was just thinking about uh, what the characters would do in the circumstances. Like, there's a body in the first chapter, not giving away a spoiler, but that kind of signals, oh, well, this must be a murder mystery. And then after that, uh, it, it, uh, that was as much nod to genre as I could, I could uh, come up with. It, you know, it's not like you said, plot driven or twisty and, and turny. There's a suspect, there's that, you know. But when I first started writing, my stance was uh, I needed a protagonist, which is Mick. So we'll follow him as he gets to the bottom of things and gets into trouble. But for me in my mental state of writing, the protagonist is the culture and the land mm. of the hills of Eastern Kentucky. Mm. And that was, that was how I sat down and write every day. So that might be what you're responding to. Sure. Um, and I, I definitely, now that you say that the protagonist is, is the land, I definitely sense that. And I want to ask about this later especially as you slip through these points of view, Mick yeah. is very clearly the, the perceptive anchoring POV, mm. but we also slip through these other POVs in ways that we fully inhabit the experience of being in this novel. And I think it was just a brilliant way. And I mean, this is a tight pack of dynamite 
you do a lot in this book. And I think what you just said about inhabiting the land and landscape yeah. protagonist, it might be the, the, the most clear eyed way of me thinking about how you pulled it off. Let's talk. I want to talk about Mick Harden. He okay. is, he is such an interesting character when his sister comes to find him, he's at his uh, grandpa's old home place. He's mm-hmm. hung over, he's sleeping out in the dirt and he's got this tortured past. Mm-hmm. He's a veteran. He's come home to what is a gut wrenching, heartbreaking complication in his personal life. Mm-hmm. And, and I know you've written about veterans before, and this is an obvious question, but I want to ask it anyway to get your take on it. What makes a veteran returning home for you personally an interesting character to write about, especially coming home to a place right. like this, this county, this landscape? I mean, I, I would think there's two, two answers. First of all, when I was 17, I quit high school and joined the Army. Uh, and it was, unfortunately, I failed the physical. So I wound up, I had no choice but to go to college, you know, because <laughs> I couldn't stand working at the hardware store. So I've often thought about what my life would have been like if, if I had been successful in, uh, in joining the Army at 17. So there's part of that. The other thing is there aren't a lot of opportunities for young people in the hills of Eastern Kentucky. There's just not much jobs. And military service is one of the top options that somebody can take. It will get you out, man or woman. You can leave home and you're out and then you can learn a skill and all that. And many of the people that I know who did that over the years, they would put their time in and go back home. And that makes for a very interesting person. I've done the same thing, I wasn't the army, but I, I left Kentucky and returned four times. And what happens is each time I left, I was homesick, but each time when I went back, I realized I don't quite fit in anymore for having been out and that increased. So a veteran is in, in a way an ideal f- for narrative purposes, for this dramatic purposes of this novel, the ideal person to bring back into the hills because he's been out, he's been in Europe, he's been in uh, the desert wars. And so he has uh, a perspective on the region and on the hills that is both from the inside because he grew up there as I did, and from the outside for having left. So for me, it was, it was, he was perfect for it. And can you say a little bit about the work he does overseas and how that experience, um, his, you know, law enforcement of sorts overseas, criminal investigation, and how that comes to bear on what he finds when he gets back home? I mean, he, he had been a paratrooper and then a, a, a combat veteran and a, uh, uh, you know, at a certain point, he got a little bit older <laughs> and uh, was sort of recruited into CID, Criminal Investigation Division, where he specialized in homicides. And part of the reason that was attractive to me was like, the soldiers are tough. They're tough people, right? And a, a military policeman, it, their job is to sort of take into custody young men and young women in the physically prime of their lives who are also trained to kill. So I thought, well, this has got to be about the toughest person <laughs> who I could imagine. Uh, you know, a lot tougher than I would have been if I had been successful when I was 17 and joined the army. So that was part of it was I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, I, I thought then he could take on anything that came up against me. And what I love about Mick is, he, he is this incredibly talented, uh, cerebral, um, uh, capable military intelligence yeah. um, officer. He's got this incredible training, tracking, investigative skills, but you don't make him a Rambo. He doesn't come back like kicking ass and taking names and settling scores and, and abusing his talents or gifts or training. You make him somebody who is called upon by his sister. He's kind of a reluctant hero and he's just helping out his sister who's in a tough spot. And there's a, there's a part where he writes, violence has happened. And the only way to stop violence from happening again, essentially is for him to intercede. And right. so he feels this duty being born of this place 
to intercede to stop more violence from happening because he knows this woman has a family and this yeah. woman's family is not going to sit by because they all either know have suspicions or they're going to find out who did this to her right and so mick feels like he needs to intercede but you never make him a rambo because he has this incredibly complicated emotional struggle that he's involved in. He also has complicated relationships to the land and the landscape mm -hmm. and the town. And so he's a really well-rounded hero. I thought he was such a fun character to- well, Thanks, about. man. I mean, he's not a Rambo. Rambo, you know, Rambo's a great movie. It was, uh, the novel was actually set in the Appalachians and they filmed it and, and made it in the Rockies. But, you know, the, those action heroes, they're just kind of two-dimensional, really. And I didn't want that. Like you can, put, uh, you can have anybody run around the country with a big gun shooting people and it's going to get real boring real fast, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a book, a movie or a TV show. So part of his motivation is to stop people from dying. And part of that is because he experienced it up close, uh, you know, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and then I guess Syria, uh, you know, maybe we're out of Syria now. Uh, <laughs> um, the other thing though is it's his relationship with his sister I mean that was important to me um, it, it most the typical uh, protagonist in a novel like this is a man who ha and his main relationship is with a woman with a, a romantic partner right and there's always two two outcomes they either break up or they stay together uh, whereas with a sibling, I, I thought it would be interesting to have a, his primary relationship be with his sister because they're stuck together, you know, especially in the hills of eastern Kentucky where family is everything. There's nothing else to be loyal to but family. So they're, you know, they can get mad at each other, mad as heck at each other, and they're still going to love each other. Uh, and it's not, there's not going to be any threat of, you know, breaking up or something like that the way a romantic couple is yeah and their their relationship and their banter back and forth the different ways in which they were raised his sister stayed with his mother he yeah. went with his father and lived with his grandfather kind of out on, on, on a piece of land and but then he goes back home to his sister's house which is his mom's house yeah and it's it's like a museum nothing's really been yeah in change and it's such a heartrending scene of, of, hmm. of kind of the amber of some of these communities. And, and I was going to read, if you'll indulge me, I want to, I want to read something that you, you say about this community, uh, specifically this old man who, who opens the novel and he's the one who finds the body. Tucker was the same generation as Mick's grandfather with all the complicated contradictions of the old culture deep in the hills, forthright, but not forthcoming honest but reticent watchful but friendly that dichotomy of seeming opposites both complicates mick's quest to find the truth mm -hmm. but also assist mick's quest to find the truth and he knows who he can rely on he knows that if he asks the right people in the right way he can find the truth yeah can you talk about what it feels like to write about a community like that uh, I mean, I'm essentially writing about the community I grew up in. So I don't know if I could talk about what it's like to write about it. It's a way of just going home. I mean, I, I get homesick ever since I first started leaving. It took me till I was 19 the first time. I'm, I wound up going back home on crutches. So ever since I've left, I feel homesick. And then writing this book and then the next book I'm working on set in the same place is a is a way of of dealing with the homesickness. And also uh, I'm just writing about people that I love, all of them, you know, the good guys, the bad guys, the in-between, the drug dealers, the, the, the crazy old people up in the woods. Like I love them and I love the land and I, I love the, you know, the birds and the flowers. And I just kind of funnel that into Mick Harden and he loves it all too. So when you ask what it's like to write about it, it's like, it's just wonderful. You know, I'm essentially writing about uh, what I, what I love the most. Mm -hmm. 
And and my what dog I, like, out. I left my dog out though. <laughs> well, what I like about it, my my little light went out. Um, what I liked about it is you talked about just now, like a respect for the people and a love for the people. Yeah, it's so easy in Appalachian lit with Appalachian stereotypes, Appalachian culture to mm-hmm. create monstrous antagonists. These, mm-hmm. these, these Frankensteins of stereotypes. And mm-hmm. you never do that. There are no monsters in this novel. Um, I think the only monster in the novel might be human nature. And that is visited, that is meted out across all of the characters. Mm-hmm. All of the characters have their monstrous human nature, even the good guy, right? They're all making good or bad decisions at different times. And I thought if this was... Um, deliciously realistic and (laughs) fairly written in terms of portraying the region. And one thing that felt to me really gentle, but powerful was the way in which you dropped in and touched on so many issues facing the region. And I, through my notes, I wrote down a couple of them. There's a moment where Mick's sister talks about lifespan that these people die so young in these communities because of all these mitigating forces that don't affect people from other parts of the country. He talked about the opiate um, epidemic. Uh, There's a mention of the economics of rural downtowns and rural areas, these downtowns. There's a bypass coming in. And Nick says, what is it bypassing? Um, You talk about logging. And all of these issues in the novel are so resonant and there's one line, again, if you'll indulge me to read your work to you, there's, there's one line in particular when there's a murder committed in a neighborhood and Mick looks up on the ridge and the whole thing's been logged. Yeah. And the narrator tells us eventually this neighborhood, it would get over the murder, but not the clear cutting on the hillsides. Yeah. You talk about some of the issues you were thinking about and how you decided to visit them or not visit them at different points in the novel. Well, the, these are very real uh, environmental issues, social issues, political issues, and I guess economic. The, and there's problems with opiates. There's problems with clear cutting. I couldn't, I couldn't ignore it, you know. Like to write a book and just ignore what's what's there would be doing a disservice to to everything, to myself, to the people, to the region, and to the book and ultimately perhaps to literature. At the same time, you know, I didn't want to hammer it, you know, and just have it be, uh, that's all it's about. So mm-hmm. I had to just figure out a way to sort of include either references to it or, or uh, comments on it uh, organically with the narration. Like when you said the clear cutting the hillside, he happens to be going up a road where there's been, uh, I think, another homicide, and that is going on up on top of the hill, and that was a that's a real issue in in uh, uh, in eastern Kentucky, in the part I'm from, where the towns are small. They're built usually at the wide spot near a creek, and the hills are are right there against the town, and the clear cutting has started to get closer and closer to town. And now there's uh, flooding right in the middle of town and, and the log trucks come through because that's where the roads are. I mean, this is, I didn't make this up. I sort of dramatized it a little bit, but you know, this, the circumstances are invented, but the, the, the particular circumstances are invented, but the situation is, is very real. Same with the opiates, you know. Uh, and now they pretty much licked the opiate. Well, I don't know if they pretty much licked it, but they put a damper on the, the prescription docs coming out of Florida. So then people just turn to heroin, you know? Sure. It's like, well, all this money and all this effort didn't really deal with, with the problem of addiction. It just mm-hmm. dealt with a, one particular uh, drug. And I, I see that as, you know, a mon- you talked about monster. To me, that's monstrous, you know? Sure. It's, but we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> well, the scene with the opiates, especially, was one of the more realistic and chilling parts of the book. Um, that yeah, scene when the, that involved the traffic accident was so well done. And uh, the sheriff 
the way she grieves in that scene, I'm not going to read it, but, yeah. but the way she just goes and just sits on a fallen tree and just sits with it. And, 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 and she kind of understands no matter what she does at the crime scene, no matter what they do to these people, no matter what happens at the hospital or the morgue or wherever they go next, nothing's going to change. Well, she's just sad. You know? Yeah. She's sad. And uh, I also think that it's, there's a generational element. You know, she's a little bit older than these younger people in that scene you're talking about. And she, she knows, uh, you know, knows the perils of youth and the attractions of youth, but uh, things are... <laughs> the available drugs are a whole lot worse now than they, than they used to be. But it, the, again, though, this book has n is not really about drugs or, or, or environmentalism or, or much politics, I think, other than the politics of writing about marginalized, uh, oppressed uh, region for, you know, two or 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. It's not about, it's not about any of those things, but, what I really loved about it is that you have this, this, this novel where somebody's trying to solve a crime yeah. and we have this wonderful hero, but you're also able to bring in these heavy issues that don't, that aren't through lines. Mm -hmm. They might, they might drive a scene, they might drive a moment, but there's just enough of them to feel the weight of it bearing on the lives of these characters in a way that feels incredibly realistic. And, and, and along those lines, there are so many beautifully constructed scenes here in the novel. Um, mm -hmm. I, could, I could talk, I mean, scenes between Mick and his wife, Mick and his sister back at their mom's house, um, scenes between him and the old man that I referenced earlier. Right. When you sit down to write a scene, whether it's in this novel or maybe in, a, in, in, in something for the screen, what are you thinking about in terms of the scene? Is, is it different every time? Or are you saying, I'm going to make sure I have awesome dialogue that's got strong context and strong subtext, and I'm going to move these characters through space. As a writer, I'm asking you, like, what are you trying to do in, in, a, in a scene? What, where, where is your mind? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it's that conscious as what you said. I mean, I, I get up every day and I, and I try to write. I try to write one minute a day. That's my goal. I've tried all these other elements. And if I can, one minute, there's not much pressure. I always accomplish it and double it, you know, and, and I get the work done. And within that the time when I'm sitting there, all I try to do is fully occupy the, the mind of the person whose perspective I'm writing from, what they see, smell, think, and feel. That's it. I mean, just, and I'll, I'll average probably a page and a half a day. Uh, I never reread, I, I, I never read, reread any of this book till I completed a draft. So, and part of that is so that each morning when I write, it's gonna be completely fresh. I'm not worried about what I've done before. As a result, the first draft is often pretty long. I have to cut the heck out of it. But mm -hmm. uh, to try to answer your question, I just, uh, the, the, when, before I fall asleep at night, I always think about what it is that I want to have happen the next day uh, when I write. And in this some weird idea that maybe I'll sleep on it overnight. And I just get up and, and, and inhabit the scene as mm -hmm. much as possible. And try to make it interesting for myself. Like, I don't worry about, like you said, moving people here or, or this or that. I just, I just want to try to write something that will be interesting for me to write so I can have uh, and also write the kind of book I'd like to read. You know, mm -hmm. like there's I love to read and I've read a lot of books, but, you know, there is a limit to the kinds of books that I would like to read. And this is ultimately what it is. My idea was it would. Read like a, read like a poem, and move like a thriller. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if that answers any part of your question, Wiley. No, uh, I like that because I think that's a great description of the book. I mean, it does read like a poem, and it, and it moves like a thriller. And you talked about inhabiting these scenes. Yeah. And I guess that's 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 kind of a, a clearer way of, of of saying what I mean is that you know I'm, I'm especially thinking uh, most 
uh, clearly about this scene. And I also want to mention, for those of you out there who might have questions about this novel or anything else Chris has written, please go to the Q&A at the bottom yeah. of the screen, type your question in, and I'll ask him the question at the end of the show. Um, but I'm particularly thinking of the scene where there are two guys pursuing mm -hmm. Mick, mm -hmm. and, and he pulls up, it's dark, they they're 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 obscured they're mm -hmm. trying to get into his house and that scene is so perfectly drawn mm. although both parties are trying to hide and it's nighttime and right. it's wooded i never lose track of where i was in that scene it was so beautifully executed on the page well thanks i mean i worked pretty hard on it uh uh I think that, believe it or not, I think that growing up where I did in the woods, uh, I spent enormous amounts of time alone in it. I think it improved my spatial thinking. It certainly helped me. Uh, I, I'm a visual thinker. You know, I'm a, my hobby is photography, for example. So I'm, I think visually. But, I, the, you know, when you're out in the woods, there, you have to have a sense of, of, uh, of space. You have to think in a very three-dimensional way. And I think it helped with that scene. Like for me, it was just like, okay, here's the house. One guy goes this way. One guy goes this way. Where's Mick go? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had to go back and set up. Uh, there's a reference to some uh, vines that are on the back wall of his cabin. And then, so I had to go back and, and place those vines on the cabin wall. I think, in an earlier chapter so they would be handy when he needed them you know mm -hmm. so that i do that kind of stuff but with revision but sure. uh i appreciate what you're saying i i don't I, I don't i just uh i try not to be confused myself and if i can use language with with as precisely as possible and and make things as visual as possible then i can understand what's going on and then my thinking is that well maybe the reader can too and it sounds like you could <laughs> um you mentioned your photography uh yeah. can we talk about that would you mind no i love photography um and it seems you know that you're you've, you've started sharing it here recently yeah. and you also have this incredible uh experience with screenplays mm. how has writing for the screen affected your fiction uh or how has your photography affected your fiction or your fiction affected your photography? Or do you find all these genres in conversation with one another? I mean, I never even th thought about, uh, thought about it. I think that if, if anything, the thinking visually helped my, uh, like I went to Moorhead state and studied art and theater. So that helped my visual thinking. And then when I began writing, that was part and parcel to it. About 15 years ago, I, went out to Hollywood to make money to pay for my, my sons to go to college. So uh, again, that helped the, the visual thinking uh, helped, you know, try to, when I had to learn how to write a screenplay, which was very foreign and harder than I thought, actually. Um, as far as how that has influenced the, the writing, I'm not sure. I think that it's probably, uh, enhanced my visual thinking, which then makes it, uh, makes it easier for me to write these scenes that some of these scenes you're talking about. Uh, a screenplay is nothing but action and dialogue. So I thought it would be easy, but really it's a document for production. You gotta, you gotta cover wardrobe and location and set and props and hair and makeup, every aspect of it and lighting for crying out loud. Whereas, what I love about returning to novels is it's just me in a room. You know, I don't have to think about anybody else. Yeah. Let that be a lesson to all the writers who want to adapt their own material. I mean, it can be done. It's just a, it was a learning curve. It was a little steeper than I thought actually. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I've heard a lot of being a breeze. <laughs> yeah. I've heard, I was like, I wrote it. I can do it. Um, but I, I've heard a lot of people say that. Um, we got a question coming in and I want to encourage everybody uh, to go to yeah. the Q a and type in a question if you've got one for Chris. But one question that's come in is, did being away from Kentucky, I think you said four times, did being away from Kentucky help you see it more clearly or did it romanticize the place 
after your absence? I don't think there's anything romantic about uh, life in the hills of Kentucky, you know, or glamorous or, or any of that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very, very beautiful world uh, physically. Life is difficult. You know, it's, it's, there's a geography, just the terrain itself. You have to negotiate the terrain, even if you're going to town to buy groceries or, or going to visit a neighbor. The, the land is there and it's some rough land that you have to deal with. So uh, I, I don't think I romanticized it at all. I, I didn't want to, uh, and I, I'm not crazy about uh, books and narratives that do romanticize any kind of rural life. I don't, I don't think, I think rural life is, as anybody knows who's spending time, it, it's difficult. You're alone and there's uh, labor to be, uh, that has to be done. Um, n- these days, I love doing labor. I write in the morning, I do labor in the afternoon, but that's because I'm doing it for myself and I can do it for 30 minutes and then quit. When I was a young man and had to do it, I despised the labor. I couldn't wait to get out. So there's nothing romantic to me about uh, life in the country other than the sheer beauty of the of nature and then the sunsets and the the frogs that, and the lightning bugs and you know the whippoorwills and all that that would be the closest i would have to a romantic view of it. is that what you miss every time when you left what called you back was the landscape uh yeah the land and um and the sense that <sighs> I didn't always fit in when I was a kid there, you know, for all kinds of reasons. My interests were different and just, I was, I was different. Um, but I fit in even less once I left in wherever I went. So I would go back home and, and feel comfortable uh, with myself. And there are a few, I have a few buddies who uh, I, I still see when I go home and I love them, you know, I mean, guys I grew up with uh, and men and women who are, you know, still there. And uh, I love to go visit and talk to him. And it's like, I never left. I can see somebody I haven't seen him in 30 years and we'll just start talking because Mm -hmm. that there's something about that, the bond that grows with children when you're way out in the woods that just, that transcends time and age, you know, Mm -hmm. and gray hair. (laughs) We got another question from Chris. Chris says, I'm a writer from Kentucky who wrote a review of this book for Mystery Tribune. Here's my question. Will the characters of Mick and Linda be resuscitated for another novel? It would be cool to see another iteration here. Thanks. Um, I finished this novel in November of, or December, I think, of 2019. In other words, just preceding the lockdown that we all endured. And I loved writing it so much. And then suddenly I had all this time on my hands. So yeah, I wrote a second book and it's set there. And Mick, it's a little bit later. Mick has been back. He's, he's there uh, and there's some difficulty. And Linda, his sister is now has to run for sheriff. You know, there's an election mm. that's involved and she doesn't really want to do that. And he's not much help there. So yeah. And the answer is yes. And um, I finished that book or a draft of a draft three and it was still quarantine. You know, I'm still stuck. I, I can go to the woods. That's about it. Uh, so I started the third one. So who knows, like, this is going to be like the, the COVID trilogy for me. Well, I think they're two wonderful characters. They're great fools for each other. And I think that anything that comes from that relationship is going to be uh, really interesting to read about Chris. So thanks. Wiley. Thank- I, I like these other guys too. Johnny boy, the share uh, the deputy. Oh my God. Johnny boy is such a wonderful character. I love Johnny boy. He's probably yeah. the closest to me of anybody in the book. You know, he believes in UFOs. He's afraid of ghosts. You know, he's very organized. Kind of he's got this right. innate, he's got this innate kindness. And there's a scene where there's a suspect in the, in the office and he wants to give him the last Dr. Pepper, but he doesn't know. <laughs> He doesn't know if the suspect will understand what a kindness that is. It's a big sacrifice for him. Yeah. Also, as he's trying to figure out, like, he's known this guy all his life. He's like, am I supposed to handcuff him? Yeah. Yeah. He's a uh, great character. He's such a good character. I should have asked about that. He's he's, he's in there. So the answer is, 
Yes, yes, yes. To uh, uh, the the other Kentucky Chris writer. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, so much. And, and I want to thank all of you for joining us on Reader Meet Writer. You can find all of these videos on Reader Meet Writer TV on YouTube. Uh, I want to thank uh, you, Chris, for joining us this early on in the book's release. Everybody, tonight, if you are here because an independent bookstore sent you the link to get here, please consider purchasing Chris's great, readable, super fun book um, from the bookstore that brought you here. Uh, and until next time, everybody, see you next week, Thursday night for Terry Roberts. And Chris, thank you again, man. This was so much fun. Uh, thank you, Wiley. I hope we get to meet for real one day. Absolutely. That'd be fantastic. All right. Good night, Bye, everybody. everybody.